I was born and brought up in the bustling streets of New Delhi, India, a country with rich traditions, customs, and now a center for upcoming new technology and a transformation in every sector. I grew up while this country was the crossroads of this transformation. And while growing up, I had this hobby of collecting miniature cars, trucks, buses. I was really proud of my collection and quite possessive too. No one, and I mean no one, was allowed to touch them. Or even the glass cupboard that showcased my prize collection. With every passing birthday, my collection grew bigger and better. And what started as a childhood hobby turned into a desire to learn more about cars. In the late 90s, we just got cable television at home in India. And it was like a new toy given to a 10-year-old. I started playing with it, shuffling through the ch uh, channels, concentrating on each of the channels for two minutes at least. And I stumbled across a channel that showed something like a red car flying on roads. It looked like a car, but nothing like the ones I had in my collection. I felt a bit depressed. My first reaction, Dad, can I please have one of these for my collection? But being a regimented Indian family, a 10-year-old never gets what he wants. He gets what his parents want. <laughs> So at the end of the day, I had to be on my best behavior for almost a week and finally managed to convince them to get me one. With my prize collection complete, I felt a sense of nirvana about it. It's quite unique. For those of you who are wondering what I was actually watching, it was the 2000 Japanese Grand Prix with Michael Schumacher driving his beautiful, beautiful red Ferrari on the magnificent Suzuka circuit. You could say I'm a Ferrari fan, hands down. Over the last 30 years in India, there has been a huge transformation. The standards of living have improved, the road structure has improved. It has meant that more people today can own cars in India. This transformation, even though for all the good reasons, has brought some very serious consequences. Last year, over 150,000 people died on Indian roads due to road accidents. That same as wiping off the entire city of Oxford in one year. That's a death on Indian roads every four minutes. By the time I finish my talk, four people would be dead in Indian roads. Initially, I very naively thought that this was a problem that we only had in India. I had this glorified vision of the Western world that had solved all the problems of humanity and was the next best thing to heaven. <laughs> but I was so wrong. I was so, so wrong. In the last 10 years, I've spent a considerable amount of time working in Germany and now in the UK. And I've realized that this issue of fatalities due to road accidents plagues each and every country in this world. The orders of magnitude might be different, but the issue itself does exist everywhere. This realization got me from a more general interest in cars into the world of safety in cars. And how can we make traveling, be it visiting our friends, a family, or visiting a local grocery shop, as safe as I could possibly imagine? In the early 20th century, we as a society, in a yearn for faster mobility, moved away from the horse-driven carriages and embraced the concept of automobiles. We imagined our future to look something like this, driving down our convertibles on the lonely road and absorbing the nature. But we ended up something like this, stuck 
in hours and hours of traffic, inhaling the pollution and people's frustrations. It's ironical that even after 100 years of technological development, in cities we still drive as fast as the horse carriages of the 20th century. And with more cars, more accidents, more fatalities. So what have we as a society gained from automobiles? According to World Health Organization, every year over 1.25 million people die due to road accidents in the world. That's half the population of Paris. Paradoxically, nine in 10 of these accidents occur due to driver error. So perhaps if we remove the driver from the driving task, something evidently we're not very good at, at least stats say, no matter what you believe, we could save people. It sounds sort of an oxymoron that we say for the progress of civilization, people need to move, but then we say to save people, they need to stop driving. Confused? So was I. But I do have a solution. In comes the utopian dream of driverless cars. Increased safety has been advocated as the biggest benefit of driverless cars, along with improved traffic flow, and more usable time for drivers. Over the last four years, I, along with my team at WMG University of Warwick, have been researching on how to bring this utopian dream to safe reality. But whenever I talk about my work, I end up answering a question, what does a driverless car look like? So today, I'll pose that question to you. What image comes in your mind when you think about driverless cars? And would you get into those cars that you just imagined? Did you think something like this, where you could take your hands behind your head, sleep behind the steering wheel? Or something like this, a shuttle which doesn't even have a steering wheel or pedals? or a bit more futuristic, a living room on wheels. Or a blast from the past for all the flim buffs here, the Knight Rider of the 80s. <laughs> I call all of these as driverless cars. But from where we are today, we are on a 15 to 20 year long journey before we can reach this utopian destination. Should we wait? 15 to 20 years for this dream? Or should we embrace this journey? As my PhD advisor once said, the story of the journey is much more powerful than the destination itself. And this journey I'm mentioning is not just a journey of re realizing the utopian dream of driverless cars. It's a journey of improving safety in cars. It's a journey of improving the safety in the driverless car technology. So how safe does this technology need to be? If we talk absolute numbers today, last year in the UK, 1,700 people died due to driver error on the roads. And if we say that driverless cars would reduce this number, let's say 20%. Would you accept them? The fundamental question I'm asking you today is, if a human driver causes 10 accidents and a driverless car causes 8 accidents, would you accept them? Probably not. But then how safe we as a society want this technology to be as compared to human drivers? Interestingly, Research by RAND Corporation suggests that if today we introduce driverless cars that are even 20% better than human-driven vehicles, in the next 30 years, we will still save 100,000 people. 
these numbers do advocate we don't need to wait for perfect automation to reap the benefits of this technology. During my PhD research, through extensive user trials, I was astounded to find that if you inform the driver about the safety limits of the driverless car, it enables them to understand when and how to use this technology, thus supplementing for the deficiencies of the technology itself and reducing the number of accidents. I coined this concept as informed safety. Informed safety means informing the user of what a technology or a product can do and cannot do. Let's take an example of, let's say, a vacuum cleaner. On the packaging of the vacuum cleaner, it says, do not, do not use it on a wet floor or as a mopper. If you do, you risk being electrocuted or damaging the vacuum cleaner. If you think about it, informed safety is everywhere. For certain aspects, it's so ingrained in us, we think of it as common sense. From a driverless car perspective, informed safety means informing the driver of the safety limits of the driverless car, and also about what the car is doing now and what is going to do next. Any automation for which we can establish the true capabilities and the true limitations is safe and beneficial. While perfect automation remains a utopian dream, via informed safety, reaping benefits of this technology can become tomorrow's reality. So how should we create this knowledge that we want to impart to the driver as informed safety? One way would be to test these vehicles. But interestingly, to statistically prove that driverless cars are even 20% better than human-driven vehicles, we need to drive them for 11 billion miles. That's 20,000 times to the moon and back. It's a bit too much. Don't you think so? <laughs> but more importantly, driving 11 billion miles up and down a sunny desert or a city with clear blue skies is of relatively low use when you want to deploy this technology in the notoriously gloomy, grainy, foggy British weather that all of us have, been ex have experienced, actually. So it's not about the number of miles, is it? It's about the quality of these miles. I call them smart miles. So what are smart miles? And how do we identify them? And why are they so important? During my research, I interviewed automotive experts across the world, US, UK, Japan, South Korea, India, Germany, Sweden, just to understand if the experts in the world had an answer to the question of identifying these smart miles. Or was it an unsolvable question? Which, being an engineer, I just couldn't accept. But not to my surprise, a solution did exist. But the solution itself came as a surprise to me. For identifying smart miles, these experts were more interested in understanding how a system failed rather than how a system worked. It's a subtle but a very powerful difference in the way the industry works today. So smart miles are essentially scenarios that reveal failures in the driverless car. For example, let's take a sunset or a sunrise scenario which causes the camera to have a washout, confusing the car completely or a foggy weather which impairs the sensors on the car, once again confusing it. Let's try and understand this a bit more with something that we use on a daily basis, some sort of anal analogy. 
So I presume all of you in the audience have a mobile phone in your uh, pockets. Because we know that a mobile phone will fail underwater, we don't use it underwater. If we didn't, we might have and broken the phone. From a driverless car perspective, once again, if I know the capabilities of the car, what it can and cannot do, I can adapt my usage of the car so that I have a safe journey back home. Even if it means saving two people for every 10 road deaths today, we will still be saving over 340 people in the UK itself. It could be you, it could be me, it could be our friends, our family. Informed safety thus says even imperfect automation is beneficial as long as we can determine these imperfections and we can inform the driver what these imperfections are. Essentially, what informed safety is saying is, trust the car for what it can. For everything else, trust yourself. Thank you.